We are starting a brand new series. It's called uh, Beneath the Surface, um, The Three Faces of Fear. So we, we kind of talked about this idea that um, this really came from, I know it's going to sound weird when I say this, um, I've been personally dealing with this kind of all um, last six months, over, even through the summer, um, this idea of what it would look like to be fearless. Uh, and not have my fearlessness rooted in arrogance or, or in foolishness, but to actually be fearless because the Bible calls us not to fear. And so we've kind of worked through that a couple times this summer, and we wanted to revisit it this fall. But how we decided to kind of wrap this came in a conversation I had with somebody, and it was through an interview talking about the faces of fear that kind of exist in humanity. And the three faces of fear came from this guy named Stephen King. Raise your, nod your head with me if you know who Stephen King is, Okay. He's not in the Bible, by the way. Just nod your head. Okay, he's not in the Bible. All right. Stephen King, who uh, made his millions in his life and his, all his, on his stories, um, uh, writing these horror and thriller things, he actually had an interview with a guy. Uh, I can't remember his name. I think his name was Doug, Douglas Winter. And it was a collection of, of interviews this guy was doing. It was called The Faces of Fear because he was interviewing all these you know, authors. And so what Stephen King decided to do is he said, hey, you know, you want to know what the actual faces of fear are? And he decided to use uh, uh, monster references in terms of just kind of human fears. He said, here's the three faces of fear. One's the mummy. And he says, that's actually the fear of the unknown. He said, one's the werewolf. And he says, that's actually the fear of change in your life. He says, one's Dracula. And that was kind of weird. And I was like, you know, as I read on, and I was like, no, this is, this is actually the fear of dark or darkness. It's kind of the fear of the dark side of nature, the dark side of humanity. When we watch the news and we think, how could a person do that? Or how could, how could somebody go that way? Or how, it's that darkness. It's that we'd call it evil in some circles. Of, you know, it's the fear of the dark or darkness. And then he goes on in this interview to say, you know, um, really fear is the oldest human instinct. This is what he calls it, Stephen King. Oldest human instinct. And actually the, the oldest of those fears is the fear of the unknown. And this is where he's decided to make kind of all his stories, kind of that tapping into, you know, as I was a kid, watch The Shining. Don't ever let your kids watch something dumb like that. So anyway, you know, I don't think my parents knew, but you know, you know, watching stuff like The Shining and just the fear of the unknown that just kind of grips us and taps into something that they've kind of, kind of claimed mastery of. I mean, Hitchcock did the same thing. And in the last decade, what's his M. Night Shyamalan? Lamalon, is that his name? Um, He's done the same thing. He's kind of tapped into this idea of, of what unites you and I together, that beneath the surface, there is a constant running river of fear. We may not even know it's there. It's just beneath the surface. It's kind of under the facade and under our lives, and, but it's constantly flowing and constantly rubbing in all these little areas. And the only time we ever really notice it is when we begin to, as Stephen King says, as we begin to realize that the illusion of control you know, we don't really control things in our life that are, that are not in our control. That we actually, this illusion of control actually feeds our fear. And then all of a sudden something happens and something doesn't happen the way you thought it would or anxieties are high and you begin to go down this path. So the other side of the coin is that we not just talked about the fact that we've talked about fear. When I look at the Bible, it doesn't just talk about the faces of fear and the way we do, you know, the way fear looks. But the Bible actually spends so much more time talking about how we respond to fear. So I said, okay, well, let's just take, you know, these three faces of fear, these common things that they've obviously tapped into. I mean, there's a, there's a horror movie or a thriller in the movie theater every week. Okay, they, 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 know that they know what exists in terms of what frightens us and how to tap into that. But now we want to also look at Scripture and talk about, well, how do we respond? I mean, that's true. We, we do fear the unknown. How do we respond when those fears kind of bubble up from beneath the surface? In our lives. So that's where we're going over the next few weeks as we talk about these faces of fear, is how we actually respond to fear. And for all most of us, it seems instinctual. Okay, so for a parent, for a parent who says, uh, you know, their kid walks out the door and you say, be careful, right? That seems like just an instinctual thing. What, but what do you mean by that? Well, there's something running under the surface. I don't know. Don't get killed. Don't kill anyone. I mean, you know, there's all sorts of like, don't get hurt. Don't don't say anything I would be embarrassed about. Don't, you know, there's just, there's this little running thing, but it seems instinctual to say, be, be careful. It's the reason most of us would choose a, a lighted street kind of going around a corner rather than cutting through a dark park, right? It's just in us. It's why we would rather have things in our job and in our circumstances. We'd rather have them pretty much stay the same 
than to experience the changeover or experience some sort of traumatic thing that would cause things to possibly be better on the other side, but we don't want to walk through that. We almost really, really would rather just stay with where things are because there's this, you know, this, this fear, this kind of river of fear kind of beneath the surface, kind of constantly running. It's when you're single and you're dating and you start sweating, you know, because there's all these kind of unknowns. There's all these kind of fears, you know, what if, what if this, and am I supposed to kiss her or not kiss her? Or I don't know what we're supposed to do. And should I touch her hand or not touch her? Is she going to think I'm this? Is he going to think I'm that? You know, all that kind of thing. Oh my gosh, am I going to get married? Are we going to get married one day? All these things running beneath the surface and start to bubble up. We start sweating. Am I going to get married again one day? If you're a young guy, maybe it's like, oh man, am I, am I going to get married? Because that's not what you want. You know, so it's like your fear is that way. There's all these things that seem instinctual, but honestly, they're just our responses. They're just the way we're responding to what's beneath the surface already. So what I want to do is walk through even today, we're going to talk about the fear of the unknown and talk about the fact that for us, we understand the fact that that is a big deal in our life. And for me personally, I've been dealing with this in terms of even not just the fear of the unknown, but I like, I like outcomes. I don't know about you, but I'm an outcome-driven person. So I like knowing how things are going to play out or, or even thinking in my mind that I actually can control how things are going to play out. And so, and so this was a big deal for me to even walk through. And I remember even working through some of these stories and just kind of sitting in some of these biblical narratives. And so today I want to share with you one that's very powerful, and it's the story of Elijah. Elijah is this incredible character in the Old Testament. He was a man of God. He was a prophet of God. Um, this is after the heyday of sort of the Israelite nation. It's after King David and Solomon. And the kingdom is actually divided now. There's mo- it's, in the, it's in the book of Kings, where there's multiple kings, multiple kings of Israel, alliances and allegiances with other nations, that kind of thing. The kingdom has divided itself, and, and there's been prophets. But, but Ahab, who's now the king of the northern kingdom, he married this woman named Jezebel. And if you've heard that name before, like she's a Jezebel, that means she's a snake. She's a bad influence. She's a bad girl. He married a girl named Jezebel. That's what it's after, okay? And Jezebel is a snake. And she's already, she doesn't worship God, which is already problem number one for Ahab. You know, Israelite king marries Jezebel who doesn't worship God. She worships uh, an idol called Baal. And so she's already had several of the prophets of God killed. But Elijah comes on the scene and, and God does something incredible through Elijah's life. And so to catch you up to where we're going to read today, I want to catch you up on the story. Uh, Elijah actually kind of busts on the scene when we see him in, in Kings. He comes in and he, and he tells Ahab that God's going to judge them and that there's not going to be any rain. And he prays that there's no rain. And then they're going to experience a little bit of a drought and God knows that they're going to experience this drought for a few years. So he actually tells uh, uh, Elijah to go to the desert. Go into the desert. I'll, I'll feed you. I'm going to have the ravens and the birds bring you food. So they were bringing him hot dogs and hamburgers and Starbucks lattes and all sorts of things, you know, because God wanted to take care of him and make him comfortable. So he was in the desert and the ravens are bringing him food. I don't know if that's worms or I don't know what he was bringing them. But Elijah's surviving and God said, go to the desert. Let's let this sit for a while. And then there's some more cool stories about a widow and some things. And I can't go into everything today, but eventually Elijah comes back on the scene and wants to see the king. And he talks to the king, and then he actually pulls all the prophets of Baal and some other prophets of some false gods. He pulls about 850 of them together on, in Mount Carmel, and this cool thing happens. He actually puts God to the test, and, and he says, let's have a showdown. You guys put this offering over here, and I'm going to build an offering over here, uh, and let's see whose God shows up. And whoever's God shows up wins. And they were all like, perfect, great idea. So there's 850 of them, so Elijah says, you go first. So they, they kill a bull, and they did the thing, and they're waiting for their God to basically light this thing up. And they're praying, and they're cutting themselves, and they're dancing around. And, and Elijah does no mercy at all. He just mocks them the whole time. He's just like, maybe he's deaf. Maybe he's on vacation. Maybe he's in the bathroom. I mean, you got to read the stuff in the Bible. It's really cool. He's like, you know, just, he's just mocking them. He's relentless. And so finally, when it comes to Elijah's turn, because the gods, their gods don't show up. And Elijah's turn, he has him pour water on top of the offering and the stones and the wood and builds a little trench around it so that the water stays close and it stays kind of just completely saturated. And then Elijah prays to God and the fire comes down and listen, it burns up the offering and the wood and the stone and the dust and laps up all the water in the ground that's right around it. Boom, right? God wins. And so and then, and then some weird things happen. He goes and he has all the prophets of Baal killed. And that's, that's a justice thing. We can get into that later. But anyway, he has all the prophets killed. And, um, and then he, he tells the king, 
because the king is pretty distraught right now, but he tells the king, hey, you know what? Go ahead and go on back to the city. Um, I hear a rainstorm coming, which was actually kind of, we read it's a prompting of God. He says, I hear a rainstorm coming. So he goes on and, and so he goes up to the mountain. Ahab goes off in his chariot and he goes up there and he begins to pray and he prays seven times for God to bring back the rain. And then he ends when he finally sees a cloud off in the distance about the size of a man's fist. And the rain comes so fast from that little cloud that it says Elijah actually had to do this like super, super uh, Superman run where he picked up his cloak a little bit and he took off and he actually beat the chariot that was taking Ahab home. He actually beat him back home. So it's really cool. And Ahab is having a, one heck of a run. I mean, Ahab is, having, is living some of the story that you and I would even long to have a taste of in terms of seeing God show up and do some incredible things through his life. Well, this is where we pick up in, in 1 Kings 19 of this story. It says, when Ahab got home, this is after the, you know, the prophets and after the rain now comes, he tells Jezebel everything, including the way he killed the prophets of Baal, which is going to really upset her. So Jezebel sends a message back to Elijah and says, may the gods, lowercase g, may the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I've not killed you just as you killed them. This is not the first time that Abraham's been threatened. But this is the first time this kind of threat has come through Jezebel and, and directly to Elijah. And I want you to notice the, ne- the next verse is what takes us into this story. It says, Elijah was afraid. Matter of fact, it goes on to say Elijah wasn't just afraid, but he actually fled for his life. Now, in most cases, when you look at a scripture and story like this, maybe our instinct would be to go, why would you be afraid? Right? I mean, you just, you've had the most incredible last three to five years anybody could have ever asked for. Why would you possibly be afraid? Well, again, this is, if we really understand the fact that beneath the surface, fear is kind of always present. Fear is always there. And what ends up happening is that what rises beneath the surface is the stuff that we actually just respond to. So maybe a better question isn't, why are you afraid, Elijah? It's maybe the better question is, Wow, Elijah, why this time? Like, why at this moment did you actually respond to the fear and run away? Well, it goes on in the story, and he goes down, and, and, and he goes off into the desert. It says he went alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. He said, take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. It's starting to sound a little bit pitiful, isn't it? I mean, it's one of these things where he's just like, okay, I'm done. I'm done. Thanks so much, God. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how he's responding here in a minute, but God has grace and God actually feeds him and says, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to lead you somewhere. You need to go ahead and get some food. You need to start eating. And he eats a little bit and then he wakes, takes a nap and he wakes back up and he's feeling all pitiful and and worried. And, and, and so God says, no, you need to eat some more. You're not going to be able to have enough strength for the journey. And then he said, he got up and ate and drank and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights all the way to the mountain of Sinai, the mountain of God. And there he came to the cave or came to a cave where he spent the night. And before we go into the interaction that God has with Elijah, because that's really the kind of the point of the story. I want you to remember this. This is not just a story about Elijah. This is a story about us. And again, this isn't so much about the fear itself as much as it is our response to the fear of the unknown. And what we see immediately what happens with Elijah is that for some reason, something happens and he begins to respond to this fear that shows up when his life is threatened. And there's three ways that we respond when we're kind of in our own own nature, when we're kind of, you know, focused on the wrong thing. There's three ways that we respond to the fear of the unknown. One is that we begin to worry. And that is, that's just a legitimate thing. That's the first thing that usually creeps up is our worry. That's when the what if train starts. You guys know what the what if, what if train is? The what if train is when you start asking what if questions. Well, what if this happens? And then, another, and then you just tap on another card, you know, another car. So it's like, what if this happens? And you hook another car on. Well, what if this happens? And another car. And next thing you know, it's this giant train, woo, woo, just going right off the cliff, right? What if this happens? What if the worst happens? What if, what if the worst than the worst thing happens? Right? 
It's that anxiousness that rises up when we begin to worry. It's the anxiousness that rises up and it's not rational at all. And it's so funny in married couples because I do some counseling with married couples and it's not like it's this way at our home or anything like that. But you know, it's so funny when you're, when you're married and the other person's a worrier or beginning to worry about something and we think that logically we should be able to walk them back down the ledge, right? Well, honey, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't matter! Because the anxiousness and the worry that begins to fill us is not always rational, but it's always powerful. Now, here's what happens. The reason worry pops up first in a response to the fear of the unknown is usually because what's unknown and what it ties back to in our life is usually the thing that we care most about. Think about the things that you worry about, and you will see the things that you're most devoted to. That's why worry creeps up first. And we see this with Elijah. Elijah, for some reason, is is filled now with sort of this worry and this dread that we see as he begins to speak to God. The second thing that happens is that we retreat. We just bail. You know, we just, we get paralyzed in our fear. We respond with worry. The what if train goes, you know, takes off. You know, we, we go into a tailspin with our anxiousness And we retreat. There's no reason to go forward. There's no way I'm going to continue down this path. I mean, all this thing, our response to fear is to go the other way, to make another path, to retreat from what maybe God's called us to do or we've been prompted to do or what we've been told biblically to go and do. We retreat when things start to not go our way or we start to fear the unknown. We don't know how it's going to turn out, God. We don't know what's going to happen around the corner. So we retreat. And the third thing I see in terms of our response to the fear of the unknown, and we go worry and then we, we retreat, is even if we do move forward, we tend to minimize. We tend to minimize maybe what we plan to do down now to what, again, we just realize that that's out of control because there's so much unknown there. So we begin to minimize and actually begin to minimize the outcomes or the process or whatever we're doing to the things that we now can put our hands back on and control. So all of this comes back to the loss of control or the loss of the illusion of control starts us in our worry. It's the fear of the unknown. It fuels that. It starts us worrying. It starts us to retreat. It pulls us back. It paralyzes us. And then we minimize. And I have to tell people that, you know, sometimes you can live your whole life with God-sized dreams and God-sized outcomes, or you can live your whole life with man-sized dreams and man-sized outcomes because it's what you can actually think you can control. And so we actually take what God might be calling us to or, 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 or revealing. I mean, this is the case with Elijah. Look at, what he's, look at what he's done. Look at what God's done in his life. And all of a sudden something happens and he begins to worry and he takes off and flees for his life. And now he's trying to control his death. And he just gives up. I'm done, God. Yep, I'm done. Done. I'm finished. Just go ahead and kill me now. You know what? If I'm going to die, I'd rather control that, right? I'd rather be killed by you, God. That's my choice. I don't want to be killed by her. I don't want to not know when it's coming. I'm going to continue to to minimize. And I I can just share with you, this is what unites our hearts together. I don't even know you, but this is the way we respond when we don't know what's going on and the fears that are within our hearts. Listen, I'm I'm scared of of movies, of um, horror movies. I don't like going to horror movies. They freak me out. The trailers mess me up bad enough as it was, it is, you know, I'm in trailers and my wife has to cover my eyes. And so it's real bad, but all of these things happen in small ways and in big ways in my life. And one of the biggest fears I have is heights. I don't like heights. That's why the stage down here is lower. You know, I'm not a big fan of, of getting on ladders or going on rides or doing things that put me out of my comfort zone. I don't like it. I go away. You know, it's like I worry about it. I worry that I'm going to have to be placed in that position. I then retreat. And then, and, and then again, I, I do the things that I can control. Nice little safe kitty rides. We go to Carowinds. And the nice part is about I'm getting older, so I'm kind of, I, feel the, I don't feel the need to like impress anybody anymore. So it's like, hey, let's go on that really cool giant throw you throw you towards death roller coaster. And I'm like, no, that's okay. No, it'll be fun. No, it won't. Cause I'm going to wet myself and cry the rest of the day. You know, like that's not going to be fun. That's not gonna be fun for anybody. 
So, I, you know, it's one of those things, that, and I don't know what your fears may be, and I don't know what you necessarily, as you walk through the fear of the unknown, it could be something as small as that. It could be as something as large as retirement, where are my kids going to go to school, what's going to happen this year with my job, what's going to happen this year in my marriage. I mean, the fear of the unknown creeps in on us, and we all respond in some way. And if we're responding within ourselves, it's going to lead to worry. It's going to lead to us retreating. And if we do press forward in some way, we we are always going to try to minimize it. So something that we can control, that we can work it out, get our hands back on on the rain and feel better about life because we can work it out. Well, here's the interaction that that Elijah has with with God as he kind of walks down the same path. He goes to sleep in the cave and then God wakes him up and says this, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? It's a weird question because God basically kind of took him on the journey. Once he realized he was kind of fleeing, he's like, okay, we're going to give you enough food for this journey you're going to be on. And then he he sees him in the cave and he says, what are you doing here? And this is where all of a sudden, you know, Elijah's heart is revealed as he kind of gives the answer to God. I've zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel, they broke their covenant with you and they tore down their altars. And the, here's where, you know, it's usually the last thing, right? And they killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. All the stuff before it was fluff. Here's the reason, the reason, the reason. And we get down to the end and Elijah goes, and now it's my turn. And God, I'm just, I don't know how this thing's going to play out. You know, Jezebel's already killed everybody. I'm the only one left. And he's fleeing for his life. And it's interesting. So God says to him, he says, go out and stand before me on the mountain. And the Lord told him as Elijah stood there, and the Lord passed by. I love this part. The Lord passes by, and it says, a mighty windstorm hit the mountains. Like, think about a tornado. It's such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose from the mountain. And it says, but the Lord was not in the wind. It says, after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Isn't that cool that, uh, well, I'm going to get to this in a minute, but I just love this part that basically God passes by and these massive things happen, but God's not really in those things. That's just the ripple effect of God's presence is the tornado and the earthquake. And then it goes on to say that after that, the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. Out of all of that, all of a sudden God whispers. And it says after there, sorry, keep going. It says when Elijah heard it, he wrapped up his face in his cloak and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. This is oftentimes what happens in the Bible when people experience the presence of God. They, they kind of run into an angel of the Lord or they, they, God talks audibly to them. Usually they bow or their faces. It's always this unworthiness that I can't even view. I can't even be seen. So it's the right response that Elijah has here, but it's because of this whisper that comes. And I love this. He asked the same question. What are you doing here? Elijah. What are you doing here? Well, Elijah responds the same way, and the best we can tell, it's probably got a different tone now that his face is wrapped in a cloak. (laughs) And he begins to realize these fears. He begins to have some sort of understanding of what he's saying to God. I've zealously served the Lord Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. They've torn down their altars. They killed every one of your prophets, and I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. And you can just hear the desperation in his voice. That this fear has overtaken him. That the fear of the unknown has just caused him to do all of these things. And, and God is saying, what are you doing here? And it's interesting because the next verse, I didn't put it up there for some reason, but the next verse is, is God says to him, Go back the way you came. And then he gives them a list of some things to do. Go back the way you came, Elijah. Go back to what I called you to do. Go back to doing what it is that, that before all this nonsense, before this response to your fear, go back. The interaction that he has with God is very interesting, but I want to make a couple, couple side notes real quick. One of the side notes is, is that usually for us, you and me, 
we are actually praying to God for, for him to show up in our fears. But we really want him to show up in the big gestures, right? In the earthquake and the tornado and the fire. Like, if God would have just said, here's the earthquake, and listen, man, if anybody messes with you, I'm going to swallow him up with an earthquake. Which God has a pretty good track record of this point of doing that. And, a lot, and, 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 and for all of us, we, we do the same thing. We, we, we take those big gestures and we want God to show up in such a way that you fix that and you change that boss and you bring that man to my doorstep that wants to get married and he's a good man, good man right there. And you change this and you help me win the lottery so I don't have to worry about retirement. And you, you show up in these big, big gestures to, so that it will calm my worries and it will put my fear at bay. And that is not at all what God does with Elijah. And that is not at all what he usually does with us to really calm those worries and really put that fear in its place. You know, this is a side note. You didn't even pay for this. This is free, okay? This is free. This is where you got to read the Bible, guys. I'm just telling you, the Bible's so good. Do you know that Elijah doesn't die? That Elijah doesn't even die. Okay, this is just one of those things. I can't, I can't really preach on it because there's no direct parallel and I don't, I don't want to preach anything false. I'm just telling you as a side note, the one story, the one time that Elijah gets derailed from doing what God called him to do, the one example we have of Elijah of falling to his nature, the one example we see, the thing that derailed him in his fear, he doesn't even have to experience that's how gracious God was to Elijah. He goes on, lives more days, does some amazing things, raises up Elisha, sees a new king, anoints a king, sees a new king put on the throne. God sends a chariot of fire down and picks him up, like a drive-by, and picks him up, and he waves at Elisha while he heads to heaven. And I can only think that they're in heaven every once in a while, and God just looks at Elijah, and it's just like, hey, remember that time? Remember that time you were scared? Remember that? Who's the man? Right? Elijah's like, yes, God, thank you. Thank you, God. Isn't that amazing? That's just a side note. You didn't even pay for that. That's just extra. That's extra. But that is, that is for me one of the things that takes me down this place of this actual encounter. That for what we can read in Scripture, what we can see biblically, is that the answer to fear has always been, fear not, for I am with you. Don't be afraid because I'm here. Have faith in your God and he will draw near to you. And so all of a sudden Elijah comes with his fear and what is the answer that he gets from God? He doesn't get his fears answered. He gets his response questioned in such a way that reveals himself back to Elijah in a whisper. And when do you whisper to people? You don't whisper across the room. You don't whisper from heaven down to earth. You whisper when you're close. When you're right there. And God shows up in that whisper to tell Elijah, there's no reason to fear. I'm right here. And again, he whispers to Elijah, not why are you afraid, don't be, don't, he doesn't cast judgment on him for his fear. He says, why are you responding to your fear this way, Elijah? Why are you here? Why are you filled with worry? Why have you retreated? Why have you tried to control your death? Why have you, why have you tried to minimize this thing that I have called for you to do in your life? Why? I'm here. The response to fear is our faith. It is what we see in scripture every time we see him say, don't be afraid, fear not, I'm with you. Have faith in me. Don't have faith in your circumstances. Don't have faith in the outcome. Don't have faith in what's going to happen. Don't even have faith that you even know what the next step is. Have faith in your God. Have faith in me. The whisper comes and says, I'm right here. And here's where I, I want to be careful because if I were to simply say, hey, 
This is how we normally respond to the fear of the unknown. But, but we have had the privilege and the honor and the ability, and we've been given a gift to know God. And so our faith is not, is not fueled or rooted in our knowledge of how things are going to work out. Our faith is not fueled and rooted in logical understandings or the way to formulize God and make it all work out the way. If I do A, B, and C, then it's going to work out this way. That is not where our faith is rooted. Our faith is rooted in who we know. And that allows us to fearlessly face the unknown in our life. It's in who you know. You know how you've heard that expression, it's all in who you know? It is so true. It is all in who you know. Jesus taught this lesson one time about faith. And when he was giving this lesson about faith, he actually addresses worry because worry is that first thing that bubbles up. It's the first thing we notice. It's the first thing we see when we begin to deal with this fear of the unknown. And so as Jesus is kind of teaching the crowd, he kind of addresses the worry as he's giving a little bit of a faith lesson. Let's go to this. uh, It's in Matthew, I believe it's Matthew 6. It says, he's in a sermon and he says, this is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food to drink or enough clothes to wear. He's kind of talking to them about the material thoughts they have, the way they, the way they worship their stuff. And he said, you know, or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more important than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds, which is just such a cool thing for Jesus to do in the middle of message. Just look at the birds. You know, it sounds like chillax and have a, you know, have a drink. You know, it just sounds like he's like, just relax. Look at the birds. But here's, where it gets, here's where it gets playing here. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. Their heavenly father feeds them. If it were to us, they don't worry about where the kids are going to go to school. They just build the nest and shove them right out. That's a good plan, by the way. They're not consumed with their 401k. They're not. I mean, just take it to our times. Look at the birds. They are not filled with worry and dread about what's around the corner because their heavenly father takes care of them. And I love this. He says, aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can any of your work and all of your worries add a single moment to your life? And this is where, I'm just saying, this is where you got to know God. If you don't know God, then you can't answer that question. But if you're on a path where you're beginning to study about him and you're beginning to learn his character and you're beginning to learn all about his unfailing love and you're beginning to experience his grace and you're beginning to know God, then when the question comes up, doesn't he love you more than the birds? What's the answer? Yes! Yes! Because that's, we know God. And so he goes on. He doesn't just finish with the, with the birds. He says, why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was never dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown in the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. I love the end. Why do you have so little faith? Jesus is talking about worry, and all of a sudden it's a faith lesson. Why? Because Jesus is emphasizing that point. Our faith is not in whether or not we know where the clothes are coming from. Our faith is not rooted in making sure that we know how it's going to work out for our kids and our marriage and my job and our retirement. It is not rooted in the things we know. It is not rooted in logic. It is not rooted in how it works out or how we can make it work out. It is rooted absolutely solely in who we know. And the only way to keep the fear of the unknown at bay, beneath the surface, is to know God. He has given us this beautiful gift and privilege to know him. And we're called to know him, to know that he's with us, to know that he's faithful, to know that he forgives, to know that he's sovereign, to know that he loves us, to know that he's just, to know that he's filled with grace, to know that nothing is outside of his reach, 
to know that he's greater than anything you could possibly face. You are called to know this. That is where your faith is rooted. And it is the only, only thing. It's the only response to the fear of the unknown that will conquer that fear. Is to know that he's your dad. That he loves you more than you could possibly fathom. So where should our attention be? I love this. I use the message paraphrase as Jesus closes out this this sermon. It says, give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard thing comes when the time comes. Not God will tell you how it's going to work out. Not God will figure out a way. Not God's going to put tools and things in your life so you can control it and figure it out. It's all about him. God will will be there. God will help you. Pay attention to what God's doing today. He's here right now. He's with you right now. Helping you with what you're dealing with right now. And he will be the one when tomorrow comes. Elijah's example is not that his fears were addressed. I mean, God didn't tell him. How amazing would it have been for God to say, hey, Elijah, guess what? Everybody else is going to (laughs) die. I got something cool for you. You're never going to die. Believe it or not, I just want you to know this. That would not have calmed his fear. Maybe it would have for a little while. But then he would have struggled with trust and he would have struggled with, are we sure? And exactly what does that mean, God? I'm just telling you, knowing the answer is not where our faith is rooted. Our faith is rooted in the fact that he came in the whisper. And he drew close. And he said, I'm right here. So how do we respond to our fear? We respond in who we know. For me personally, this has been a a journey this summer. As I've prayed and asked God, please just, in every situation, how do I handle this? How How do I approach this with fearlessness? How do I not get overwhelmed with concern? How do I not get overwhelmed with all the things I don't know? I know that in that process for me personally, this is why we're we're doing it now here in the fall, but in that process for me personally, he's had to work me back to a place to where my eyes are not fixed on the outcome and my eyes are not fixed on the things I know, but my eyes are fixed on him. The one who loves me more than I could possibly imagine. The one who loves this church more than I do. The one who loves this city and has given me and you an opportunity to make a difference here. So when I look at people and I walk, I've been sharing with people as I've been on this journey, just some really amazing ways that God is meeting the answer to my question, which is how can I lead? How can I love? How can I be fearless? Because I I know that fear is not going away. Well, it's first and foremost responding in faith and knowing that my faith is rooted in who I know, not what I know, but who I know. I asked Chris, if you would today, kind of in a different way, I'd asked him to kind of sing a prayer over us. Um, so I want you to bow your, your heads and you can look at the screen if you want to, but I asked basically Chris to take us through a time of just meditation and prayer where he began to sing some words over us that we would begin to understand that no matter where we are right now, no matter what circumstance we're in, no matter where we find ourselves today, whether we're in the middle of responding to fear or whether we're just starting to, or whether we've been, we've been, we're in the wake of a tailspin in our life of responding to the fear of the unknown. How much faith we can have in our God who have been given the precious gift to know. To know that he's faithful, 
to know that he's sovereign and to know how much he loves us. And then I'll come up when we're done and, and pray. We got a special announcement afterwards, but let's just go to him now.
You're perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. You are sovereign over us. You are sovereign over us. Let's just continue that prayer. God, no matter where you find us today in each one of our hearts, you know what's there. You know what we worry about. You know what we're devoted most to. You know as that is revealed in us, and God, as we lose that illusion of control in our life, God, that we face the battle of whether to respond in faith or whether to respond to our fear. God, give us a thirst to know you. The way that you've called us to know you and that you've made yourself available to be known. God, I pray today, God, that you would just, you'd overwhelm us with your faithfulness. You'd overwhelm us with your love and your desire for us to know you. God, if we've been living this life and in just our efforts to control our outcomes and our efforts to control as much as possible. God, would you just deal with us today? Would you just give us an opportunity to know that our faith is not and is foolishly rooted in our own control, but our faith should be rooted in who we know and not what we know. Father God, we know it's the only way to cast out that fear, to have victory and overcome it. God, as we continue the series, I pray that you would move in a mighty way, that you would meet us where we are, and that we would continually be changed in the likeness of your son, Jesus. And we pray all of this in your name. Amen. We hope you've enjoyed engaging in our worship experience. Everything we do at Journey is to help make a difference in people's lives. If God has been moving and working in your life, we would love to hear your story. You can share that with us at mystory@thejourneyonline.com. If you would like to invest in the ministry and mission at Journey Church, you can give at thejourneyonline.com. Thank you for investing in the lives that are changing at Journey Church.